rap shit. Sergeant Smack make it backflip. Telly Hank it with the action. With the Bible speaking Spanish. Frank Matthews, how I vanish. Poof. Came back like I'm King Tug. Go BBS is on a beamer. When fat cat with 10 queens up. Fall off the prop and not the re up. Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus. Uptown like I'm Baby Major. Caught a touchdown. We invite you to take a video visit of San Francisco, an enchanting city, one of the most romantic cities in the world. Less than 50 square miles of actual area, yet large... This is what has happened since the crackdown began. San Francisco police narcotics officers have made more than 1,000 arrests. They have seized some $160,000 of alleged drug dealers' money. And they have found and confiscated at least 52 illegal guns. Yeah. What's up, little partner? What's up with you? What's going on? Hanging out with my man, JB, and Earl Slim Stevens. <laughs> the nickname that I gave him. Big Slim. What is it, though? <laughs> <laughs> know the story of Al Capone, where they couldn't get him for prohibition, so they got him for tax evasion. That's the same thing with me. You couldn't get me for crack cocaine, so you got me for tax evasion. I'm the youngest person in the history of the United States to ever be charged with a tax evasion case at the early age of 25. I did 27 years in federal prison. 27 straight, no breaks, no nothing. No coming home, make another kid, go back to the pen. No, 27 straight is what I did. This is a true uncut story on how the cocaine era was ran in San Francisco. Yes, I said it, I'm stamping it. I was the largest cocaine drug dealer in my era. San Francisco, the cosmopolitan city. Children and guns. All part of an escalating drug war being fought night and day and in and around San Francisco's housing projects. Open drug warfare that police say is about to blow out of control. Reporter Bob Serkin joins us now with the latest. Bob? Bob, San Francisco police tell us they're making 1,000 drug arrests a month in the southeastern part of the city where the drug war rages. But those arrests say police aren't even making a dent in the amount of drugs being sold and the violence that drug dealing brings. It's happening in nearly every housing project on over 35 so-called hot street corners in a seven-square-mile area encompassing Potrero Hill, Bayview-Hunters Point, and Visitation Valley. Open dealing of crack. Dealers armed with automatic weapons and police scanners selling their stuff night and day. A high-profit drug trade that rival gangs are fighting for control of. Narcotics Sergeant Rene La Provat says the drug war is on the verge of exploding throughout the city. The majority of the drug dealers out here have armed themselves against other drug dealers. Uh, they're using those arms against each other. They're using them against police responding into this area. Uh, they're trying to repel the efforts of Oakland drug dealers and Los Angeles drug dealers to come in here and take over the drug trade. More than 40% of San Francisco's homicides are drug-related, some gang-style murders. Police have now identified at least 20 drug gangs operating in San Francisco's housing projects. This is a collection of gang members' hats. This one says GT, Geneva Towers Gang, HT, the Hilltop Gang. And all these hats have one thing in common. They all boast of cold cash. Thousands of dollars a week, often earned by children as young as nine years old, staying out of school, acting as lookouts for drug dealers, Sergeant La Provat. They're earning uh, much more money than uh, educated people are doing what they're doing at age 10 years of age. Uh, what's, what's the motivation to go to school to get your high school diploma when you're making $500 a day out here selling dope? And police tell me they believe there is a connection between the drug warfare and the recent rash of attacks against muni buses and drivers. Police think drug dealers are staging those attacks as a diversionary tactic to take the heat off themselves. But this whole tense situation has put the heat on City Hall and the police department. It was a time of struggle. The dope era. The crack era. Crack was just coming on the scene. And I started selling dimes. I started from nothing. I would get a Baskin Robbins spoon and I would take it and I'd fill it up, flatten it out with a card, 
take it and put it on the album cover and split it down the middle. And I would sell each one of them for $10. That's how I got my start. We ran San Francisco in its entirety. Hunter's Point. The crack dealing is especially heavy and violent in the Hunter's Point area. Today, while gathering these pictures, cameraman Jerry McEwen and I were attacked by a youth who blew out the rear window of our car. Police aren't sure if the youth hurled a rock or fired a gun. Lakeview, Fillmore, and we started to branch out into other parts of the Bay Area. I took that hustle to multi-kilos to being able to travel to Columbia and buy directly from the Colombians and fly the drugs back to the Bay Area. I was buying 500 kilos cash. Me and my crew was running through them every month. I was taking a delivery of 500 kilos a month and going through them. When you think of urban black gangsters, you don't think of San Francisco. You think of New York. No, we got gangsters. We got gangsters here in San Francisco. Phil Mo Slim, Ronnie New, the Ward brothers from Oakland. Me and Dora Reed from Oakland, Lil D, we rubbed elbows. Felix Mitchell from Oakland. I went down to LA, did deals with Harry O, to sitting at the Grammys with the Jacksons, to owning 7-Elevens, body shops, roofing companies, delicatessen, liquor stores, Rolls Royces, Mercedes Benz, 15, 20 car fleet, the jewelry, 13 karat single stone diamond rings, million dollars in jewelry. And I still got some of it. See, look, I still got some of that stuff, man. This stuff is old, man. This is some of the fruits of my labor right here, man, that I still got. How many dudes you know still got a jury after 30 years, man? I still got mine. And the government saw that I wasn't just the average dumb black kid who just bought cars and jewelry. I was trying to find a way to legitimize my money by taking it and sticking it in the businesses. And the government said, hold it, wait a minute, this guy is smarter than the average cat. We have to stop him. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy Pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to Cali with it. San Francisco. It's our first time around this bitch. We need somebody to point us to Bayview Hunters Point. We trying to see what's shaking. <clears throat> we gonna tap in where everywhere else, but you already know what it is. Sunnydale, Ocean View. Mission District, Fillmore neighborhood. We gonna be passing through. Y'all look for us. We gonna need everybody from San Fran to get in the comment box below. We got one of the biggest in the city to ever do it coming through. And today we are gonna be covering none other than James J.B. Beasley Jr. Now, before I get into anything with J.B., I want to talk a little bit about now i want to ask a question really i want to know what the relationship is like between san francisco and oakland anybody in san francisco anybody in oakland y'all let me know i'm thinking it's like a cousin city situation um yes but besides that i want to talk a little bit about bayview hunters point and that's going to be one of the areas in san francisco and it's going to be the first that James Beasley mentioned when he talked about setting shop and from the information that I gathered about the area um, really like in the 1960s Bayview and Hunters Point neighborhood were populated by predominantly African Americans and other minorities and it was an area that was isolated from the city of San Francisco they said it had pollution substand substandard housing declining infrastructure limited employment and racial discrimination where those were all notable problems and it would eventually be a race war in september of 1966 when a 16 year old that was fleeing from a police officer um a 16 year old by the name of alvin johnson um or the police officer was alvin johnson and he ordered a gentleman by the name of matthew johnson who was the 16 year old assailant so that's just a whole ironic twist but um i'm sure it's no relation he ordered him to stop he they said he fired warning shots and then he ended up fatally killing 
the 16 year olds. So that led to Robert F. Kennedy, a gentleman by the name of George Murphy, another gentleman by the name of Joseph S. Clark <clears throat> to visit the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood with future mayor Willie Brown um, and speak with the activist by the name of Ruth Williams about the inequalities going on in the area. So that was then based on my recent research, I saw that they are like a lot of kind of low income areas um, and deprived areas. I did see that at one time it was voted the most isolated uh, like part of San, of San Francisco if that makes any sense to so anybody that ever been in the area explain what that means and i also seen that they were going through gentrification which every city seemed like it's saying no matter fact, if you ever lived in a project or a project and you still live in that city tell me is that project still existing because it's very few i know in new york they have a couple the one not like the one i frequently grew up in as a kid that one is still standing the couple i know in ba that's been here those are still standing but in a lot of cities it seems like they're they're removing them we talked about gentrification going back as far as like uh, three years on mob ties and it's in full swing now if you don't know what that is it's happening around you you might want to do some research on it but now we can get into james beasley because this was like not a small no small fry deal this was this was top of the line big deal shit and i saw where even two men were sentenced for trying to kill a witness and his trial he was he's on trial in 1990 and they had two gentlemen uh pretty much by the name of ricky bradley and another gentleman by the name of edward powell they were sentenced to i want to say 20 years for attempting to kill a witness that was set to testify in james beasley's trial and in his trial he was convicted like he said they did get him for tax evasion but they did have witnesses that got on the stand and said that they saw him with upwards of 2.5 million dollars from drug proceeds um they also had accounts where he did uh and, and this was between 1986 and 1987 where he did a series of deals um, involving 100 cocaine 100 kilogram deal he said he did another he did 250 kilogram deals within that time another 75 kilogram deals so it was definitely not not nothing not nothing small he would go on to pretty much account to the media and describe pretty much how he rose from the streets of Hunters Point to become pretty much probably one of the largest dealers in the whole state of California. We're not even talking about San Francisco. We're not even talking about the Bay Area. They're going to say at his peak, $3 million drug deals was common and there was no luxuries unobtainable. And they say he had luxury homes in different cities. He went to the grammys with the jacksons and they say he was almost a millionaire 20 times over and this was in the 80s so that just goes to show you the level um of of traffic that he was on man they labeled him a menace to society in 1991 so you know they pretty much had to take him off the streets he was sentenced to 27 years he did that he's home now and he's doing good <clears throat> Y'all make sure y'all check out his book. He have one out called Deeply Rooted. Y'all make sure y'all follow him on Instagram. I want to say it's under under Deeply Rooted or Derooted. Yeah, shout out to James Beasley. Welcome home. Know the mob salute you. Um, y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. I'm going to be back with some more real trill spill shit. Y'all hit the bell under this video to know when it's coming. Y'all know what it is. It's the mob. Mob, 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 ties.